Let's pray. Yes, Father, prone to wander, we confess that and we pray that you might use your word today to, to bring us back on track, our thinking, our lives. And we pray this through Jesus. Amen. We've been uh, having this little series in the sermons on deciding for Jesus. Jesus who loves to put people on the spot. Uh, but who do you say that I am? Will you also go away? Do you say that or is it only what other people are saying? So we've looked at a few Bible passages in which Jesus is doing this. He's challenging people. Uh, where do they stand? What, what response will they make to Jesus Christ? Well, uh, here in our passage this morning, uh, Jesus in his own way is doing this again. So let me take you to Matthew chapter 11 and from verse 46. Uh, the scene here, we have Jesus and his disciples. I imagine, I imagine them kind of sitting fairly close to him and then behind them, a house filled with people. Outside the house, uh, the mother of Jesus and his brothers come to fetch him. The message is sent in. Uh, they're wanting uh, Jesus. And then in response, we have this extraordinary question by Jesus in verse 48. And I've no doubt that it's because of verse 48, this question, that these things were remembered, recorded, and this is available to us this morning to look at and to learn from. What does Jesus say? But he replied to the man who told, told him, Who is my mother? And who are my brothers? This extraordinary question by Jesus. So what's happening here? Yes, uh, Jesus in the house. Uh, at the beginning of the next chapter, verse 13, we're told the same day Jesus went out of the house, sat by the sea. So here he is in a house. Uh, the house is filled with people. And uh, so if the mother and brother of Jesus want to get to Jesus, they've got to send a message in and hopefully Jesus will come out to them. But the response of Jesus, who is my mother? And, and who are my brothers? I don't believe there was ever a person who said so many extraordinary things. No one matches Jesus. I uh, used to buy. You used to be able to buy these books. No, it's all on the internet these days. But I used to be able to buy these books of, of quotations, and uh, you know some extraordinary quotations, and they're always interesting. Well, well, Jesus is the most quotable person in history. Now, other people, of course, are famous for their quotable quotes. Oscar Wilde or a Christian version, G.K. Chesterton, who were just really good at saying striking things. So there's always lots of quotations by Oscar Wilde and, I hope, G.K. Chesterton in books of quotations. But you could fill books just with the quotations of Jesus. He was so often saying extraordinary things. Well, this is one of the extraordinary things. A quotation of Jesus, who is my brother and who, so who is my mother and who are my brothers? Uh, uh, to start with, it almost sounds rude, doesn't it? Though we would never accuse Jesus of rudeness. It, it, it's almost like a dismissive question. Brother? Mother? Do I, do I, have, a, do I have a mother? Do I have a brother? He seems to be denying the connection here. Why would Jesus say such an extraordinary thing? Who is my mother and who are my brothers? Well, he's, he's saying this in a very kind of dramatic way to make the point, a very important point, uh, is that he's not going to let natural ties and social relationships determine what he does. Rather, it is the love and will of his heavenly Father. That's what explains who Jesus is and what he does. It's his connection to his Father, his Father in heaven, not his natural family. Well, there's, uh, 
other quite well-known passages of, of Scripture that make clear, of course, his uh, love and devotion to his mother and his brothers. Uh, the most famous one would be, of course, in, in John 9, chapter 19. So we're not going to be able to accuse Jesus of being unconcerned uh, about his uh, human family. Jesus on the cross, uh, John 19, and we remember how he made provision for his mother. I'm reading from verse 26, when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing near, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. And he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his home. So here is Jesus concerned that his mother would be provided for and he places his mother in the care of the disciple whom he loved, we believe the Apostle John. But it's interesting, isn't it, that he doesn't commit his mother to uh, the family, the family of, of Joseph and his stepfather Joseph, but he commits uh, his mother's care to a disciple who now becomes the son of Mary, in effect, because this disciple John, as we believe, is the brother of Jesus. So even as he's providing for his mother, he's, he, he's again redefining family relationships. But the family of Jesus is not the physical family that he might be connected to. But he does care for his mother. And don't forget, we have just that little snippet in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 when, when we're, we're reminded of the different people that the risen Christ appeared to. And it says, and he appeared to James. James, who was one of his half-brothers. So we're not going to be able to accuse Jesus of being uncaring or thoughtless about his mother and his brothers but it's the father connection which explains who Jesus is. And that's the point he's making in this extraordinary question. Who is my mother and who are my brothers? We have to turn to the next chapter of Matthew 13 to see people again making a mistake in this area. The last paragraph in Matthew 13 where Jesus goes back to Nazareth, his hometown... And the people amongst whom he grew up did not react well to him. What's the problem? Let me quote. Uh, is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? Are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And are not all his sisters with us? Uh, where then did this man get all this? See, the, the people of Nazareth couldn't work out Jesus Christ. In fact, they took offence at what he was saying and doing because they were trying to understand him in terms of his human family. His mother, his brothers, and uh, added to that, sisters. Now, we're not going to understand Jesus if we just think about him as the son of Mary or the half-brother of James but it's the will of God, his father. It's the father connection that explains Jesus. And of course, that's the point he goes on to make. Um, in verse 48, uh, 49, stretching out his hand towards the disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and my sister and mother. It's the father connection. Jesus is the eternal son of God. He's come to earth to do the will of his father. Not, he's not going to listen to anybody else, but the pleasure and will of the father is everything to Jesus. So, so Jesus here is helping us to kind of think more clearly uh, what is our response to Jesus to be? Well, it's the will of God his Father. And what is God, God the Father's will? That we believe and follow Jesus. See, that's the important thing. Uh, it's remarkable, really, that people who are so definite and clear-headed about other things are often so muddle-headed and vague when it comes to the Christian faith. You know, people who hold down a responsible job 
People who show a great deal of intelligence in other things can be so mixed up and wonky headed when it comes to Jesus Christ. Well, Jesus here is assisting them and us to be crystal clear. If we're going to properly understand and respond to Jesus Christ, it's the Father connection that we need to see. And what is the will of the Father of Jesus? It is that we believe and follow his Son. So let's try to be clear-headed about this. Now, another thing we notice here, don't you think it's wonderful in verse 49, what does it say? And stretching out his hand toward his disciples, he said, here is my mother and my brothers, the disciples. The special connection that the disciples of Jesus have to him, his mother and his brothers brothers. That, that should thrill the heart of any believer. Jesus is our older brother. He looks upon us as his mother, his brothers and his sisters. How loved and secure that should make us feel. Now, of course, even for Christians, sometimes their feelings uh, deceive them. We, we can succumb to worry or, or we can feel all alone. We can feel abandoned. Well, a passage like that is telling us, yes, our, our fears are not, and our feelings are not properly uh, representing our true situation. We are loved. We are cared for. We have an older brother who is looking down upon us and who is caring for us. At the end of Matthew's Gospel, again, it's just a little snippet, but it, it is just so full of meaning. Uh, the risen Christ, as he uh, tells the, the women to announce his resurrection, uh, 28 verse 10, Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. He's talking about the disciples. Go and tell my brothers. And then the last words we hear from the risen Christ, uh, and behold, I am with you always to the close of the age. Isn't it a wonderful thing that we can use this family language? Jesus is, has to, is teaching us here to use this family language. How are we to view him? Yes, he's our God and saviour. Of course he is. But Jesus is also our older brother. And we are his mother and his brothers and his sisters. The, the Christian faith is being summed up here using this language of personal relationships. The human family is being used as an analogy, yes, for our relationship with God. He is our father. Our relationship with Jesus, he is our older brother, and also our relationship with each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. And when we think about how the gospel message is proclaimed and explained in the Bible, well, often again, it's, it's simply using the language of personal relationships. We're out of relationship with God. It's, it's estrangement, it's enmity, it's guilt. What do we need? We need forgiveness. We need reconciliation. These things, these are really the language of personal relationships. And the gospel message of Jesus is how we come back into relationship with God through Jesus, through his work for us on the cross. We, we, we take that by faith and we receive all the blessings, but it's the language of personal relationships. So whatever big words ministers might sometimes use, and we're allowed to sometimes use big words, forgiveness, redemption, justification, reconciliation, sanctification, all these kind of things, when we really think about the Christian faith and the truths of the faith, 
we're never really talking in abstract theoretical terms. No, really the very best way of speaking of the faith is the personal terms that Jesus himself has provided. And indeed in this passage it's the language of family relationships. And um, so what could be more personal than that? And then if we think of the Bible, we could put it under the heading of theology. But what's theology? It's the study of the way, the character and the ways of God and, and God who is personal. In fact, he's three persons in one. He's the tri-personal God. And through his son, he's patched up this broken relationship that we have with him through sin. And we can be restored to relationship with God through Jesus Christ. As I said, so that we have God as our father and we are the brothers of Jesus. And when, when we think of the Christian faith in those terms, doesn't it make it the most attractive message in the world? It's all about the restoration of personal relationships. Most of all with our Father God, but then, of course, with others as well, as that relationship with God begins to have an effect on what we're like and what we're doing. Now, let's look then at what really is, I suppose, the challenge also in verse 50. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mothers. When uh, Jesus says, in effect, he says by that question, you know, that, you know, who is my mother? Who, is, who are my brothers? Uh, Jesus here is not saying, well, I'm not taking any notice of anybody. He's not denying all connections. He's certainly not a free spirit. No, it's the father connection, isn't it? Not the will of his mother. Remember in John chapter 2 at the wedding, they ran out of wine and his mother tries to get him involved. And again, this is another occasion where he seems to speak quite strongly, but we should not take it as rudeness. Uh, John chapter 2, verse 2, uh, uh, verse 4, sorry, uh, Jesus said to her, to Mary, O woman, what have you to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Jesus is simply making the point, I'm not going to do something because you asked me to. Jesus listens to his Father in heaven, you see. And then just a few pages over in chapter 7, where his brothers suggest that he go up to Jerusalem for the feast. And uh, Jesus says something similar here. Uh, Jesus said to them, my time is not yet come, but your time is always here. Both those passages use this idea of the time. Jesus is not going to be told what to do by his mother, by his brothers. His time, his timetable is set by what his father says to him. And so Jesus is someone who does the will of God his father. And so also the disciples of Jesus, those who follow Jesus, for whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. So this, this is the family characteristic of Jesus. Of Jesus. How, how do we tell people who are in the family of Jesus? We're looking around and... Are they big? Are they small? Are they tall? Are they short? What's the colour of their hair? They're not the distinguishing features, are they? We can always recognise the family of Jesus. When we come across another Christian brother or another Christian sister, we, we recognise them pretty quickly. They're those who are doing the will of the Father of Jesus. And of course, the beginning of that or the heart of that the will of God, his Father, is that we believe and follow Jesus Christ. Of course, if we're, if in, in describing Jesus as our older brother, of course, we're not putting him on our level by any means. Just as when we know that God is our Father, 
We're not putting ourselves in the level of Jesus. Notice here that Jesus says, my father, whoever does the will of my father, not our father, my father, there's the unique father-son relationship, a matter of being and eternity. Jesus, who is God the son, so there's a, a uniqueness about that father-son relationship. But in a lesser sense, of course, through Jesus, through our connection to Jesus, God also becomes our Father. In that sense, we're invited into the family of God and the privileges that the family of God have. So doing the will of the Father of Jesus. Now, of course, Matthew in his gospel really tells us, in a sense, more of that will than any of the gospels. Remember how Matthew has these uh, big five uh, uh, um, kind of lessons or teaching by Jesus. The most famous, of course, in chapters 5 to 7, the Sermon on the Mount. But there are other important passages uh, too. The whole of chapter 10, which gives instructions about disciples. Uh, chapter 13, which is quite a long chapter, which has uh, uh, many of the, the parables of Jesus. Chapter 18, where Jesus talks about the community relationships of his people. Chapters 23 to 25, where Jesus talks about the future. So Matthew provides us more of the teaching of Jesus than any of the other three, to three uh, uh, Gospels. So he, he gives us a great deal of what the will of God the Father might be for us. But the heart of it, don't miss this. To miss this is to miss everything. The will of the Father of Jesus is that we believe and we follow his son. And then Matthew gives us details. What does following mean? So here's another passage in which Jesus is challenging us to decide what is our response to him going to be. Let's pray. Yes, Father, we thank you that we have the teaching of Jesus. We have his words recorded for us here in Holy Scripture. We thank you, too, for the striking way in which our Saviour speaks. And I thank you that it kind of cuts through the, the funny ideas that we might have. It corrects our thinking and enables us to understand the truth. Lord, thank you that what Jesus says here is amazing but wonderful. That God can become our father and that he offers to be our older brother if we do the will of his father. Lord, enable each one of us to respond in the way that is being urged here. That, that each one of us will be people who believe in Jesus and then put that belief into practice in our daily lives. Lord, it's our prayer that uh, Sunday by Sunday as we gather here, here that we might receive help and encouragement and instruction as we seek to be the disciples of Jesus in a time which in many ways is so confusing and so challenging. Thank you for your word. Thank you for our Pastor Graham, who is regularly teaching us out of Holy Scripture. Thank you for our brothers and sisters who are on this same path of discipleship with us. Thank you for all the encouragement that they give us. And so we return thanks to you in the name of Jesus, our Saviour. Amen.